to a cloud. Let's Hello, everybody, and welcome to day three of the 15 day global plant rich diet challenge. My name is Andrea Wotan. Some of you know me already, and I'm a member of the SRAG plant rich diet task force. And we've worked very hard to find excellent speakers to provide information supporting our journey. And today is no exception, as I am very pleased to welcome all of you and our speaker, Vicki Brett Gock. Did I pronounce that correctly, Vicki? You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've been practicing. Okay. <laughs> um, Vicki is a master certified vegan lifestyle coach, whole food plant-based culinary instructor, and certified personal chef. She has been trained in nutrition for a, a healthy heart and in dietary therapy for reversing common diseases. Vicki is Forks Over Knives plant-based certified and holds certificates in plant-based nutrition, in culinary coaching, and in wellness counseling. As a personal coach, Vicki helps people across the country prevent and often reverse chronic conditions of all kinds, simply through a change in menu. She also provides corporate wellness counseling and teaches whole food plant-based cooking classes to individual clients and to larger groups of all sizes. Vicki has created original recipes and written articles for the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies website and served as a special project author for their updated certificate in plant-based nutrition program with her plant-based food guide, How to Eat Well on a Budget. Her recipes have been featured in Barefoot, Barefoot Vegan, The Beat, Honest Cooking, The McDougal Newsletter, Center for Nutrition Studies Newsletter, The Vegan Friends Cookbook, Cookbook Perfectly Plant-Based, and The Main Street Vegan Academy Cookbook. Connect with Vicki through her Ann Arbor Vegan Kitchen blog at annarborvegankitchen.com. And I just want to tell everyone how honored and thrilled I am that Vicki is here with us today. She's a great friend. And I have been so lucky to actually eat beautiful, delicious food on numerous occasions that Vicki has made. And I'm going to tell you, I, I think I've gone back for thirds every single time. It's so delicious. So we are so happy to have you here, Vicki. Thank you so much for sharing your time and take it away. And oh, and by the way, I'm putting the links to the recipes uh, for download in the chat. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, and so nice to be with all of you today. I'm really looking for this one that we are going to start with today is a creamy mac recipe, a creamy pasta recipe. I call it a vegan mac and cheese, vegan mac and cheese perfection, in fact, but um, it's not exactly cheesy. It's really just a creamy cheese-like sauce that um, is just as rich and delicious as a cheese sauce would be, but without any of the things that come along with dairy. Many people suffer indigestion with it. It's a high fat I mean, there's lots of reasons and the climate and all kinds of reasons that we'd like to move toward avoiding dairy. And so this, for those of us who do not eat dairy, many times we're kind of craving something creamy. And this really satisfies that um, craving, I feel like. So I'm excited about this recipe. It's become kind of a staple in my household. Even my non-vegan friends and family like this dish. So it's kind of one that we use in a uh, heavy rotation. So here we're going to get ready to share it with you. So the first thing that I'd have you do if you're cooking along with me or doing it on your own later is to preheat your oven if you'd like to bake this. You actually, the way I'm going to show you today is just kind of creating a sauce and putting it over pasta and it's ready to go. If you want to heat it slightly, you can do that or you can bake it. So it's kind of two different ways. I used to bake it all the time every time I made this. And if you are baking it, you'd have a baking dish ready and heat your oven to 400 degrees or even lower, 350 to 375, um, all the way up to 400, depending on how hot of an oven, how quickly you'd like it to heat through. Um, but today we're just going to create the sauce and put it over a cooked pasta and it's ready to go. So I do it both ways. So we make our pasta or we can be doing that while we're making our sauce. I actually did prepare pasta just a few minutes ago. So we're gonna have that ready to use. And we're gonna start with our sauce. So in a blender, 
we're going to take one cooked onion. And what I did was saute this onion just in a little bit of water. You could saute it in oil if you prefer. I like to avoid oil just because I like the way it tastes better without the oil. And um, I'm convinced that I, it's a healthy way to eat, but you can certainly add a little oil if you'd like to. And so we've got a cooked onion we're gonna dump into our blender. And to that, we're gonna add one cup of raw cashews. So when you're buying your cashews, you wanna make sure they're not already roasted. These are just unsalted and raw. To that, we're gonna add one cup of a non-dairy milk. I'm using a soy milk that is plain, unsweetened. You wouldn't want a vanilla flavor or any kind of sweetener in here. So this is just a plain one. You could add almond milk, rice milk, oat milk, anything you like. And now we're gonna add about a half of a cup of water. So we're basically making a made cashew milk and thinning it out a little bit with some water as well. With our milk and our, I actually take a red pepper, red bell pepper, and roast it in the oven at 350 for just whole on a baking sheet for about 30 minutes. Or you can take a shortcut, as I am, with a jarred roasted red pepper. So I'm just using um, half of a jar, could be a 12 ounce or 16 ounce jar. There's a purpose that doesn't have any sugar added. I like, got a little splash there if you want to roast it yourself, but it's a shortcut, I think, is to just use a little bit um, to use the jar that's already roasted for you. And then when you take it out of the jar, just use about half a jar and rinse it off. I like to rinse off, it feels a little, the liquid feels a little thick and I like to rinse it back off so that it feels more like the way it would come fresh out of the oven. This I'm adding two tablespoons of lemon of a vegetable broth. So we have, um, I, this is a vegetable broth that um, again has no oil in it. That's the way I like it, but you can use any kind you like. And then two teaspoons, I'm just going to eyeball this. I like a little extra. So I'm just gonna make sure I've got plenty here. And then we're gonna add a little bit of salt, a couple of teaspoons of salt, a little dash just for a little zip of red um, cayenne pepper. You could leave this out if you wanted to make sure it didn't have that little bite a little bit of heat. Um, I like that in it. Um, and then I think I skipped one. nutritional yeast may be the only ingredient I've mentioned that sounds less familiar to some of you. You can buy it packaged in a container, often with seasonings. It's really just a, used as a seasoning, although it is rich in B12. But um, most people just use it because it has almost a kind of a cheesy like flavor as if used too much. So I don't have, you know, I just use a quarter cup and I think that's a nice amount in here. So we've got our cashews, let's see our onion, cashews, milk, water, red pepper, the yeast, lemon juice, and our seasonings, the vegetable broth, mustard, and salt. And now I'm just going to blend it. So we're going to turn on the blender here. I'm going to make noise for a little bit mm -hmm. for a moment here too. We're going to try to get it nice and creamy. And we're done. We have our sauce. Vicki, could I ask you a question? Vegetable sauce? Absolutely. Yes. Can you tell us more about water sauteing? Because 
that's something that a lot of people don't know about. And even those of us who do know about it, we, we really don't know how to do it because when I looked at your onions, they looked sauteed and I don't really know how to get that with water sauteing. So how do you do it? How long do you saute? Absolutely, I would love to. Yeah, so I get a nice heavy saucepan. I have some other vegetables to show you because I'm gonna add these at the end, even though you don't need to. I get a nice heavy saucepan and I add to that saucepan the onion. And I have usually try to have the pan already at some high heat. So medium to high heat, put the onion into a hot pan so that it starts to sizzle right away. And that allows some of the caramelizing of the, and the sugars in the onion to come out and start to brown a little bit. And don't touch anything. You're probably tempted, most of us are, to give it a stir, but you want everything to kind of sit in that heat for a moment until it starts to get a little golden. You don't want it to stick too much because you want to, of course, be able to move it around and release it from the pan when you're done. So you can, along the way, if you want to add a little splash, say two tablespoons to a quarter cup of water or broth or even wine or some other liquid that you like. And, um, kind of what's called deglaze, kind of scrape the pan and allow the water or liquid to be absorbed in the sauteing vegetable, whatever it is, whether it's an onion or shallot or garlic or whatever other vegetable. And so then you're allowing, it does take a little bit longer when you're using water instead of um, the, the oil that many of us are used to using. It takes just a few minutes longer, but it really does get just as golden, just as caramelized, and it works just as well. So yes, it gets nice and golden and the vegetables work great that way. In fact, I'll show you this as well because I also, along with that onion that I showed you a moment ago in a separate pan, I took, this is how simple it was. I took a shallot, which is, you know, many of you may know what a shallot is. It's a type of you know, the, a, a root vegetable that's something between an onion and garlic in flavor. And I just sauteed that. I put that into a hot pan. And on top of that, to put two packages of frozen vegetables, just again, for a quick shortcut of organic spinach and baby broccoli. I just covered the shallot that was freshly cut on this hot pan with these two packages of green frozen vegetables without thawing or anything and just allowed it to start to sizzle, then give it a few stirs and just within a few minutes, um, I started to get, again, kind of a golden, all of the onions kind of cooked up with the, here, let's see if I can get a nice scrape here, a nice um, spoonful to show you. But I sauteed these up to, um, I'm, wow. I'm gonna come closer to the camera, <laughs> just in this hot pan. Uh, let's see, here we go. Oh, wow. Yeah. Just Looks showing wonderful. Up. Yeah. So, you know, with just that shortcut, because uh, sometimes the difference between, you know, using something that's a shortcut, like a frozen vegetable, is the difference between making something healthy and maybe not getting to all those vegetables you're trying to eat all day long. So, um, yeah, I, I like to have something like this. I've been doing this for the last couple of weeks. It's just so easy to have some frozen vegetables handy and some an onion. If I didn't have a shallot, I'd use an onion and just saute them all up together. The onion gives those frozen vegetables a little extra interest. And I actually sprinkled it with a little hot sauce and a little bit of salt and pepper. And this is just like a wonderful add in to basically whatever you're eating throughout the day as a main dish. So I, you can add it to your potatoes on top of your baked potato or over your toast in the morning with some non-dairy cream cheese, or um, I'm going to add it to this pasta today. So that's, I like to, you know, just have some vegetables on hand of all sorts, roasted, sauteed, steamed, whatever um, combination to be able to add to whatever I'm making because the more plant-based more plant rich foods, the better. So we've got our sauce that's all ready now and we're ready to plate this up. Thank, thank you, you so much for sharing that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, you're very welcome. <laughs> no, you're I was going to say thank you so much for sharing that. It's such a great idea. I mean, you know, it's so, it's such an important part, like point that you raised because, you know, a lot of us just don't have the time, you know, during the week to, you know, get all those vegetables in or chop everything, you know, and so having those frozen vegetables on hand is, 
perfect. I mean, it works so well to have that. So. It does. It does. And not only chop it, but wash it, you know, first of all, bring it home, right. You know, it frozen, you can have on hand anytime. And the nutrition profile is very similar to fresh and you don't have to take all the time to wash and strip your greens and, you know, you right. can buy kale or and I always do have those in refrigerator. So just right before we went on, organic whole wheat pasta doesn't need to be organic. It doesn't need to be whole wheat. It could just be white pasta or um, brown rice pasta if you're avoiding gluten or any of the many kinds of pastas that they're making now out of all kinds of interesting things from chickpeas to lentils and quinoa and so on. But I'm just gonna put this into this pasta into a nice big serving bowl. And it's still warm. And now I'm gonna pour this sauce over it. It is so cool. Really rich and creamy sauce. Oh, wow. It's so cool that you used raw cashews. I didn't know you could do that. I thought you had to soak them or do something with them. That is really neat. Well, Andrea, I'm glad that you mentioned that because you don't need to soak them as long as you have a high powered blender. If you have just kind of a regular blender that um, doesn't have an extra powerful motor, it is a good idea to soak it for a few hours or overnight to make sure it completely dies with the and turns into a delicious creamy milk or you know cashew cream so it's a great idea to um to soak it if you don't have a high power blender but otherwise if you do like a vitamix or one of the other powerful ones you don't need to i'm gonna add just a little more sauce get it a little mm -hmm. more rich and creamy yeah i know i always like mine really saucy <laughs> right right yeah. Yep. So that you can do this to taste. And this actually stores nicely, this sauce in the refrigerator if you have any leftover. So for my family, I would actually put this in a jar and then you know, another day during the week, someone might take some out and pour it over fresh pasta or broccoli or a potato or some other kind of you know, way you could use this. So you can definitely do that and you can freeze it as well. So now we've got our pasta and it's all nice and rich and gooey. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I can't believe that only took about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes to make. It was so make. fast and it <laughs> looks fabulous. I can't, oh my gosh, can't wait to make I know, it. It's so good. And so now, because I've got this vegetable here, why not? I, last week I made something like this and I added roasted red cabbage and onions because that's what I had. But let's just cover it with some vegetables because vegetables. <laughs> you can't get enough. <laughs> can never get enough vegetables. Agreed. Right. You know, one of the things that we hear, Anju and I as registered dietitians, we hear from people all the time is it's just too hard. And it's just, you know, intimidating because it's hard and it takes long to make vegan food. And look at but, this, this was delicious and took 10 minutes. Yeah. And it looks oh, and you can beautiful. actually use absolutely any kind of vegetable you like. Happen to have green, it's a nice contrast. You could add more, more onions, sour, I mean, absolutely anything that you like. So this is a more onions and uh, spinach and broccoli on top, but um, yeah, so it's ready to go. And in fact, I'll, I'll plate it up. Wow. Oh, yeah, super duper fast. <laughs> super duper fast and really nice and nutritious. Yeah, and really satisfying. Yes, all whole foods and no oil. And you can That's definitely bake this if you want. So that is our main dish today is our creamy pasta with vegetables. So I'm gonna set this aside and we're gonna make our dessert. Hey, Vicki. So well, our next thing we're- We'll all be over soon. Yeah, we hope you have a, <laughs> a large table because we're all gonna be over for lunch very soon. It, I will it, leave I the door unlocked. Just come right in. 
So our next thing we're going to make is brownies. And we were talking just right in the beginning today about how much so many of us like to have something chocolate. And what's especially nice about this recipe is it's really quick and it's actually no bake. So it's kind of like somewhere between a brownie and fudge. I'm just gonna move this better. I'm just gonna make room for my food processor here. And we're gonna pull that over here. There we go. So this is a super easy recipe and it's super healthy because it's just made with actually ingredients. They're all whole plant-based ingredients. There's no sugar, no free, there's no flour in fact. So it's gluten-free and there's no oil. It's just a really delicious whole food recipe. So we're gonna start with two cups of raw walnuts. And again, they're not roasted, they're just raw. And that helps them grind become ground into a nice mm -hmm. fine powder. And that two cups of date mounded because I wanna make sure we get up. That's where all, all of our sweetener is coming from, this whole food. Nutritious dates. The pits are already taken out, of course. And then to that, I'm adding half of a cup of either cocoa powder or cacao powder. And then three tablespoons or about one shot of prepared espresso. So I just used a pod in an espresso machine and this is decaf because I may want to have this something like this later at night when I don't want any caffeine. Um, and if you want to leave out the coffee flavor, you certainly can, but um, I like it with this with the espresso because it turns it into a mocha brownie. So we're making a no bake mocha brownie. And to this, we're adding a teaspoon. I'm just going to eyeball this too. Of vanilla, pure vanilla extract. You could substitute vanilla powder if you wanted. And now we're going to just turn this on and grind it. So we're going to make a little noise again for a minute. So bear with me. We're gonna to try to make it um, grind up to a process to a texture that is sort of like a texture of, um, well, you'll see in a moment, but kind of like fudge or kind of like cookie batter. Technical difficulties. Let me just <laughs> give this a stir. Just a damp liquid, just a little bit dry. I'll try that again. Well, Let's see if we're maybe. All right, we're in for a moment. Bear with me for a second. Maybe you have some questions, but for some yeah. reason, this kind of got kind of got all sort of stuck. So we'll just try to release that. Don't worry at all. We were having our own technical difficulties yes. last night at our first <laughs> presentation. It it happens. Um, yeah, I, I don't know why, but it seems like everything is kind of stuck in a little blob down there. We'll try again. Oh, I want I had a question for you and anyone please chime in if you have any questions. Sure. Uh, if you don't have an espresso maker, can you just use old drip coffee a little bit? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can use coffee. It does 
doesn't have to be espresso. It's espresso a little bit. So you're really looking for, for a strong coffee flavor. That's a great question. Yeah, it definitely doesn't have to be actual espresso. Or if you can make it from a powder, basically you're looking for just the flavor that comes from that. And um, about three tablespoons of up with without. Oh, you just broke up a little bit. What was that you said? Here we go. It looks much smoother now. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, and thank you for bearing with me as we had a little difficulty with the food processor moving along. And I think this kind of points out that in real life, things like this happen. And sometimes we just have to adjust. So, you know, if the food processor isn't moving along, it's probably something sort of stuck in a blade or it's more liquid or something. so you just a splash of something it could have been we could have added a little splash of um you know something like a raspberry juice or it could be absolutely anything so um but we've got the texture that we're looking for which is kind of this heavy fudgy texture i'll see if i can move all of this out of the way so you can see a little better and i have a, i have a recommendation for everybody too if you're finding that an appliance you turn it on and it doesn't work Make sure it's plugged in. I can't tell you how many times I've thought my appliances aren't working and I just forgot to plug it in. <laughs> yep, I've been there too. And they do, electric appliances really do work much better when they're plugged in. I have found that as well. <laughs> so I'm just going to put some gloves on only because this is messy. You really don't need to, but um, this part is a little messy because you're using your hands. You could use a spoon, but I just find it works better. Um, to just kind of dig right in there with my hands. So we've okay. ended up with this, as I mentioned, a texture that is just kind of like fudge now, where um, really thick kind of cookie batter. And so if we had it any wetter, it would maybe be a little too loose for what we're looking for, which is to kind of create a nice solid bar when we're done. So now we've got this beautiful batter. And I'm just taking this pan, which is about $6 on Amazon. You don't need to use this. It's called a Brownie Bites pan and it's made of silicone. You could use just an eight by eight dish and just uh, put this into the bottom of an eight by eight dish. But I'm taking these little pieces, little bites of it and sticking little mounds, about probably, oh, tablespoon or so into the, each of these little squares to create little bite-sized pieces of these little brownie bites. And what I find is that if you freeze these or stick them in there, I mean, they're perfectly great to eat right now at room temperature, but I like them better cold. I think they um, just kind of create a really nice sort of decadent feeling dessert. And what's nice about this recipe is that it makes quite a few. So we're going to end up with probably 24 brownies here. And they, as I mentioned, they freeze really well. And what's also really nice about this is it's great for something last minute. When you find out someone's just stopping over in a few minutes or you've got dinner plans and but nothing for dessert. This is something that comes together so fast that, um, you know, it's kind of the type of thing you can make anytime. I make a version of this at Christmas time where I add mint, like a peppermint extract instead of uh, the uh, mocha flavor, the, coffee, the espresso flavor. And you can add really any kind of flavoring that you like. So if you're adding mint, you wouldn't add as much, just maybe a little half a teaspoon or a teaspoon because mint extract is really strong where the coffee flavor is really quite subtle. Vicki, excuse me. So I, we're just, just feeling this. Yes. You just made me think of a question. Um, I loved what you said that you can put it together so quickly if you need something um, 
if you need something quick to offer to guests or maybe to take, well, that was my question. Can you plate these to take them as a take. dish to somebody's yes, house? Absolutely. I'm going to do that when we're done. Oh, great. And I will okay. say that they work best if I'm going to show you what this looks like when we finish and I get all of these filled and I'm almost there, you know, and you can take as much time and be as careful as you like with them. I'm kind of rushing to get them all in while so we don't take too much time for this part but um you can make these all nice and neat and what you could put a nice like raspberry in the middle of each one and make it really extra special pretty if you wanted to but just nice and simple i'm just kind of flattening all of these out and now and i've got this plate of here i'm going to take this off now we've got this platter, you know, that's oh, already wow. filled wow. Yeah. with these little no bake brownies. So yeah, I'm going to just show you what they look like. And as I mentioned, I really like them cold. And I think they work really well when you allow them to get a little bit more solid. You know, now they're a little bit warmer than room temperature because the blade and the friction. But um, if we let it kind of sit for a bit, it'll get a little bit more solid and easier to pull back out. But oh. you can see even just right now. Oh yeah. They're ready wow. to go. So I'm just gonna pull a few out, show you what they'll look like. They look delicious. Vicki, Margaret had a, yeah. question, had a question for sure. you. Sure. Can you use any other type of nuts, per, per, uh, perhaps pecans? Absolutely, you can use any nut you like. And I actually use walnuts because walnuts are so good for us. They're full of omega-3s. And I don't love eating walnuts by themselves. So this is kind of a fun way to make sure I'm getting a nice healthy nut in here. But yes, you can use, you could use peanuts. You could use, I mean, you know, peanuts and chocolate are a kind of a classic. Um, so yes, you can definitely use any nut you like, pecans, walnuts, um, almonds. I'm just gonna, I just thought of this. I'm just gonna throw a couple of these on top. Oh, good, what a great question. Yeah, now you can. Yeah, absolutely you any kind of nut yeah you absolutely can you, know, you could use a nut butter for that matter as well hmm. wow i can imagine those are favorites when you take yeah. those to get to friends homes absolutely and they're just really nice to serve at the end of a little family dinner as well so just happen to have some berries on hand so we'll just throw a couple on top and we've got our little easy oh, to wow. make Beautiful. no bake dessert oh that Let's looks see if so I can get delicious and that was so fast too so fast oh, yeah a whole meal the pasta and the brownies that was just wow you can just whip it right up yeah so we've and got the, our Alyssa pasta Alyssa put a nice comment in the chat. She said, I love making recipes like this into small balls and coat with coconut flakes, like truffles. Oh, what a great idea. Yeah, you could definitely turn this into a ball instead, roll it in coconut, great idea, or a ground nut or more cocoa powder mm -hmm. or you know, ground granola or something like that. So uh, all kinds of ideas. Definitely, you could do that and definitely add some other texture to this. You could add a dried fruit other than you know other than the dates which are sweetening it but maybe something that adds a little color so yeah you can do all kinds of fun things great ideas so yeah so we've got our pasta and we've got our dessert and we're ready to go wow those are beautiful vicky i can't wait to try Yay. those they can oh, so easy i can't believe how easy they are yeah, I think they, I think sometimes that's just really the important part of, you know, making sure we can get dinner on the table. And if it's easy, it makes it doable. So you need that. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, I oh, just, ahead, I had a question. I mean, I actually was wondering, you know, just from, um, you know, if someone is, you know, just kind of starting from scratch and trying to find their way, you know, going plant-based, what's the, what are some tips that you would recommend, you know, to kind of make things a little bit easier for people to just start, you know, 
Just, well, that's a great question. And I think that I have found it's a little bit different for everyone because for some people, um, not spending a lot of time in the kitchen is important and other people do like to cook. They're just not quite sure what to cook. So I guess what I usually do with my clients when I'm working with them and helping them figure out what their first ne next step might be, it's to start with foods they like. So if they love burritos or they love pasta, you know, those are the kind of dishes that I first try to help them find delicious alternatives to using meat or dairy in. And, you know, just a delicious marinara sauce that has some vegetables in it is a great place to start for a nice, wonderful dinner. Um, you know, lots of times people think that that people that are plant based, all they eat is probably, you know, salad and tofu or salad. something. And it's, it <laughs> yeah. couldn't be farther from the truth, because right. I think that when you start eating foods that include lots of colors and vegetables, mm -hmm vegetables and, um, you know, satisfying grains and potatoes and things like that, you start to, your palate opens up to all kinds of new ideas and food becomes more exciting than ever. That's what I have found. I always like to cook even before I was plant rich, but now that I am eating this way, I love cooking. It's become more than a passion. It's kind of an obsession. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I have found really found that, um, the more things that you find that are, are foods you've always liked that are plant-based and you didn't really think about it that's a great place to start. So, so another idea is doing what is sometimes called batch cooking, which is cooking mm -hmm. a larger quantity like we are here. So that every time you go to the refrigerator to look for something to eat, you've got something in there already. Some pasta with vegetables, a dessert, some fresh fruit, keeping things handy so that there's always something to choose because if you've got it available, that's what you'll eat. And if you don't you have to start thinking about and making decisions and finding ingredients that maybe aren't handy, that's a little bit more. So keeping it easy, I think is important. Starting with foods you like, like if you like potatoes, like I do, which is probably my favorite food, I cook like five pounds of potatoes at a time. So that whenever I'm hungry, that is always an alternative. I can always grab a potato, put some vegetables on top or some soup that I made or a sauce like the cheese yeah. sauce. Um, um, you know, so that you've always got some handy. So great questions. And I put some foods that you can kind of mix and match throughout the week as well, some soups and sauces and um, potatoes and pastas and stuff like that, that, um, you know, you can turn into leftovers the next day with a wrap or, a, you know, another way of, of repurposing it. That's a, those are also helpful for a lot of people. Wonderful tips. Thank you so much. Of course. Vicki, I have a couple questions for you. Um, you mentioned that you like to cook five pounds of potatoes and have them around. So do you, yes. how, how, yes. long do, how long do they last? How do you store them? And, and like, what will you do with those potatoes? Okay, so that's a fair question. And I think what I would do is I, I often will buy five or 10 pounds of potatoes at, at a time for the week for our family. And um, I will say I eat most of them. <laughs> myself. But so what I do is I take, let's say they're russet potatoes, but really doesn't matter what kind. Um, any kind of potato, I will take them and I will scrub them and make sure that they're nice and clean. And then with a little um, paring knife, I'll remove any of the little pieces um, in the potato that, you know, look like they would be not pleasant in your mouth. So I, I pull out all those little I guess they're called eyes, but um, the little dots on the potato that don't feel like they would be as um, tender. So then I poke the potato with a knife or a fork several times, and I bake it at usually 375 for about an hour till they're a little bit tender to the touch. I pull them all out, let them cool enough, and then I put them in the refrigerator. Now, then after I've done that, now I've got five pounds of potatoes, that might be 10 or 12 potatoes. They never go bad. So here's a few of the ways that, and when I say never go bad, what I mean is we eat them before they've had a chance to go bad. So usually I'm going to say about five days or so they'll last easily in the refrigerator. I don't know beyond that because we don't usually give it a chance to do that, but often a potato or two will become a meal. So for our family, so we may take a potato or two, open it up, maybe put a little salt and pepper on it, warm it and add some of last night's soup or stew to it. So we top it with a little lentil soup or um, a you know, vegetable stew, something like that, or a curry. Um, 
Another thing that I like to do with the potatoes is slice them up or chop them into squares and air fry them in an air fryer with a little seasoning till they get nice and crispy. And that can be a nice side dish or a main dish. Again, it could have something that you're dipping in, maybe a little non-dairy yogurt with some mustard added to it or hot sauce or some salsa, something like that to give it a little flavor um, as a little dip. Um, so air fried potatoes um, under a soup just by themselves. Um, another thing that, uh, let's see what else would be another way of doing it. I'm at the cheese sauce with vegetables like that. Wonderful. That sounds so good. You know, I'm so glad that you gave yes. us those tips and told us that because um, a lot of people, unfortunately, potatoes have been, uh, they've been given a bad reputation, you know, in the media. And, yeah. and when people, when your clients say, oh my gosh, I love potatoes, but I think I'm not supposed to eat them. What's your response? How do you help them get comfortable um, that you, potatoes are great? You know, well, I think that it, it, sometimes it takes a little time for people to recognize that it's the potato that has so much nutrition. It's the company that potatoes keep with the sour cream and butter that have given them the bad rap, right? So, um, sour cream, I guess I missed that one, but if there is other delicious vegetable ingredients, like we just talked about now, full of flavor and um, you know all kinds of fresh herbs and all all the things that that you might want to add for flavor, then um, what you're really doing is giving your body exactly the energy that it needs to do its best. So sometimes it's a little bit of um, you know you know like a dare, like see how you feel if you try eating potatoes this week or sweet potatoes, just one a day. See if that makes you feel. See if how you feel. And surprisingly, not only is it delicious. People who are trying to lose weight often can lose weight by switching to eating more potatoes and sweet potatoes instead of the foods they were maybe eating before. So, um, you know, and for many people, it's the food they've been craving for years, but they just thought they're not supposed to eat it or it's only something at Thanksgiving or, you know, that it's kind of a decadent choice. But in fact, it's really, it couldn't be more nutritious and our, our body knows exactly what to do with that food. So it's a good choice. Thank you so much. That was such a, a wonderful answer. And I would echo everything you say. Potatoes are a wonderful, helpful choice. Most of us love them. In fact, I heard someone say recently that he, I think he saw a study, some kind of study that was done that found that potatoes are the, the world's favorite food. Everybody loves potatoes. So yeah I, yeah, I have heard that too, that it's the number one food for satiety. So, yeah. I mean, that's the food. What, I mean, it's kind of interesting because I think that when people are avoiding it, they find that they're really kind of craving it. And you may even eat more food without it, but you still don't feel quite satisfied because your body hasn't gotten those important complex carbohydrates that we need. You know more about this than I do, Andrea. This is really what you know so well. But our, this is what our bodies need to do their best to wake up every day full ready to get to work so it was all day long you could eat I mean they're completely healthy with um with that and I'm not suggesting that people don't eat other good delicious nutritious foods along with the potatoes but that can be at the center of your plate for sure thank you so much for that I have, I do have one more question, but I also just uh, want to give, if anybody else has any questions, we've had some nice um, absolutely recommendations in the chat. Um, Alisa was, is loving what you're doing. She's um, saying this is dinner tonight. And <laughs> thank you, Lisa. Good. Yes, please. <laughs> Okay, Vicki, yeah, so when uh, I've been asked if there's one uh, vegetable that I could have on a desert island, it, uh, my choice would be the potato. <clears throat> so anyway, <laughs> that's just my comment on that. Um, when you're coaching people and yeah. they say to you that I get digestive problems when I try to go plant-based, what is your general uh, counsel for them? 
Well, I guess I would want to know a little bit more about what kinds of problems they're experiencing. Sometimes I, I think that it is true that, um, and I've heard this said, that the more people need, the more people avoid um, vegetables or the more they think they don't like vegetables, the more they need them. Because you know, if we're not eating the amount of plant-based foods that we should throughout our day or week, um, you know, our, we're suffering where our, our bodies aren't getting the nutrition that they really can operate best on. So I think that for some of us, there's some maybe toxins that we need to get rid of. Maybe our bodies are backed up a little bit with foods that were harder to, to digest before we switch to eating more plant-rich foods. Um, for people eating beans, I know that, or legumes, I know for some people, they do experience some gas initially when they try to eat a lot of um, foods that include a lot of beans. And so generally for that, most people suggest just starting off with a little bit of beans if you're not used to eating those so that you can, your body quickly adjusts most people, I think, to that. But um, for some people, there's a little bit of trial and error. Uh, you know, we all do have a slightly different bodies. We're unique. And so some people prefer certain foods and do better with them. So I think that the more you start to allow yourself to be exposed to eating more and more of these delicious, nutritious foods, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, you know, all these greens, as well as um, all the other things we've been talking about, and certainly beans as well, beans and greens are, there's nothing more nutritious. But as we're eating those along with those potatoes and other foods, um, I think that you'll find most people will find that they start to feel better than ever. And so my, my suggestion would be to give it a try, be patient and allow yourself a little bit of time for transition. Yeah, so I, I think that transitional point is such an interesting one because you know when you increase the fiber in your diet, then it changes the whole composition of what's happening in your digestive system, the microflora and so forth. So it seems like there's really a conversion that takes place. That takes time. So you just stick with it. I've heard people say that, you know, people who have coached others, you know, they say that if you just wait it out and it's going to, you know, settle down. But then experimenting, yes. and, you know, there could be foods that you're just sensitive to, to and you need to maybe avoid certain foods. I think that's exactly the bottom line that for some people, there are certain foods that maybe they're a little bit sensitive to. And so, you know, maybe eliminate that for a little bit. But um, I, I don't think that um, that's true for most of the foods we're talking about, you know, with uh, that may be true for beans and greens as people adjust to more of that. But starting with, a, um, you know, some oatmeal in the morning and, um, you know, some potatoes for lunch, maybe brown rice in your dinner. These are you know, simple ways to add more complex carbohydrates that will kind of get the process started as you become more satisfied and, you know, are, are able to um, learn to enjoy some of these new ways of including these healthy foods. So thank you. You're, you're welcome. Vicki, I do have, well, wait, I want to open the floor if there are any other questions before. Okay, I've got a question for you. Um, and you kind of already answered it and this is a yes. hard question as well. So I'll just warn you. What, what in your experience have been those aha moments for people who really, really want to change their diet um, for whatever reason, maybe they're suffering from um, a health issue or they just, they just really feel strongly this is what they wanna do, but they also feel a lot of resistance. What, what, is it, what is it that they do or they taste or that is that aha moment for them when they say, oh my gosh, this is working or this is, I really like this or this is, you know, this is something I can do. I know it's a hard question, but do any thoughts come to mind? So I think that's a great question, Andrea. And I think that in my experience working with people, often it's through my cooking classes that people and, and now, you know, we're doing things virtually, but when we were able to do things in person and people would taste things, that was sort of an aha moment for a lot of people to realize that this food, although it may not include some of the things they were used to eating before, 
it's really delicious. And I think that the more people realize how good this food tastes, the more they want to include healthy foods in their diet. So I think that's the first aha uh -huh, is realizing that this, this can be really delicious. But the second is it can be really easy. So I think that combination of having foods that are sort of leaning on what we think of as comfort foods, but plant-based versions of those, I think is a great place to start. And that often will be the place that people, you know, kind of have that aha moment. I think when people start to have, um, oh, just as an example, like a tofu scramble instead of scramble in the morning, that's seasons things. That's an example people kind of are thinking about um, they don't want to give up too much. And naturally, it makes sense that we want to make sure that we're very happy and satisfied and love the food. So I think that's usually the key is uh, finding for people with them what it is that they love the most, you know, again, kind of going back to those ideas of potatoes or pasta or burritos and things like that, or hamburger if that's a food they always love, you know, switching it out to a tempeh burger, or a bean burger, finding alternatives that are just as delicious and just as full of flavor, covered with toppings with tomatoes and avocado and pickles and all the stuff people love on, on you know, if they were piling up toppings on their burger, those sorts of things to just kind of create a delicious combination of flavor and texture so that people love the food. That turns out to kind of be the yaha, I think, for many. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, that is really, that is really wonderful. And um, yeah, I think I've seen that too, that when people actually start tasting the delicious food, especially when it's food that you make, because that's always <laughs> very delicious. But any, you know, any of these delicious recipes, they really start to yeah. realize, wow, I'm not giving anything up. In fact, my yeah. world of food is expanding. That happens a lot. So thank you so I much, so. Vicki. This has been so lovely and delightful. I think we've all enjoyed it. We can't wait to make your recipes. And everybody, please, please, I really, I, I mean, I'm telling you, Vicki's food is delicious. I've been so fortunate to, to enjoy it on multiple occasions. Her, she's got wonderful recipes on her website and arborvegankitchen.com. Don't you have a cookbook coming out soon? Yeah, thank you for mentioning. I'm actually working it and my do follow Ann Arbor Vegan Kitchen. Um, and then I'll be having information on there about my book coming out soon as well. So yes. Great. Okay, well, we can't wait to, to see it come out. And we wish you the best of luck. And we thank you so much for this wonderful demonstration. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you including so me. Much. It's been great to be with all of you. Goodbye. And thanks to all of Bye. you. Thanks for joining and we've got a lot more great uh, speaker sessions to come. So we look forward to seeing you in the future. Bye-bye everybody. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.